It is. Referenced in a couple of podcasts recently that um, even one of the Wright brothers thought that heavy than, heavier mm-hmm. than um, air flight was only possible in 50 years. Yep. Oppenheimer didn't think, you know, um, sort of the chain reaction was possible yes. at all. Until yes. Until yeah. two years I th- Yeah. I think it is... Uh, uh, you know, incredibly hard to, you know, to make any, you know, definitive statements about the timing of future technologies. Uh, And, um, you know, people are constantly pressing me to try to do that. And, you know, I can say what I hope will happen. I can say what would surprise me a lot if it did happen. Uh, But I can't make categorical statements about it, right? I feel like if you really want that, well, then, you know, go to someone who's gotten rich on the stock market, right? You know, don't go to a theoretician like me. (laughs) Uh, You know, like that's just not my competence. That's not my specialty of making predictions of exactly when things are going to happen, right? And one of the ironies that I think, you know, one of the biggest things people don't understand is that we can say far, far more about what a quantum computer will ultimately be able to do than we can say about the exact details and timing of the path of getting to that point. And so it's almost like I can tell you more about what quantum computers will be 200 years from now, if civilization lasts long enough, than I can tell you about what they will be 10 years from now. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So, well, then let's talk about, like, whether civilization has a good chance at... Oh, man. <laughs> 20, oh, man. 20 to 200. Yeah, right, 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 so right. Existential risk is something you've thought about a lot. Um, and, you know, you've disagreed with some people about the timeline mm-hmm. of AI mm-hmm. and things mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, what, what are your thoughts around X risk? And- well, I mean, I am... Uh, you know, I wish that I could be more optimistic than I am about the future of civilization. Uh, I mean, you know, I feel like we are we are in a very very scary uh, era of history. Uh, uh, you know, we are um, having an impact on the planet that is not sustainable. You know, we sort of know what direction we have to be moving in to make our civilization sustainable. And you know, all over the world, uh, we've seen a rise of you know populist autocrats who are kind of moving things, pushing as hard as possible in the exact opposite direction. Uh, so that, that, that's really the, you know, and who uh, more or less explicitly reject uh, the ideals of the Enlightenment, uh, which I think are, are our best hope of survival. Uh, and that's really the part that scares me. And, you know, and actually the truth is when people ask me, you know, uh, all these prediction questions, are we going to have... Uh, error-corrected quantum computers in 50 years? Are we going to solve the P versus NP problem or solve quantum gravity in 50 years? You know, I, I, I usually I, I just, I'm ultimately forced to say, well, you know, my first question is, are we going to have a functioning civilization in 50 years? You know, everything else is kind of downstream from that. Yes. What ways do you see possible AI weaponization um, being the most dangerous and how do we bias the development of AI, mm-hmm. whether it be, you know, um, mm-hmm. stupid, stupid AI doing nasty things, yeah. or super intelligent, um, mm-hmm. how do we develop pathways for, to avoid AI weaponization? Well, I mean, I mean, AI has seen, you know, uh, some remarkable progress uh, within the last decade, right? That is, uh, you know, actually uh, exceeded, I think, what many of us expected, right? Yeah, I think, you know, there is probably now uh, no uh, game, you know, of perfect information, nothing like chess or or Go uh, uh, or anything like that where humans have a chance, you know, against completely general purpose machine learning algorithms. Uh, You know, and people used to, uh, you know, have, uh, 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 you know, I guess I'm, I'm, you know, uh, uh, 37, but that's old enough to remember when people would just make fun of machine translation or something that never worked face recognition, voice recognition, just things that, you know, uh, ne- you know, don't work and never will. And, you know, and that was true until they, they started were actually working. Okay. So, uh, um, you know, so of course it's a, an object lesson and, you know, all the people who confidently pronounce about the next thing that can never work, right? Well, you know, they've been wrong in the past. Uh, so I think, um, Um, AI becoming smarter than humans, you know, and taking over the world, that is not something that I know any law to rule out. No, you know, there's no law of physics against it, no law of logic against it. Um, 
it is it does not tend to be my nearest term worry uh, you know, I, I like to say that uh, uh, I think, you know, civilization will have exceeded my expectations if it manages to avoid all the mundane things like, you know, global warming and, uh, you know, nuclear war and uh, ocean acidification and, you know, resource shortages and it manages to just survive long enough, you know, to be destroyed by something cool like a super intelligent AI, right? I mean, you know, like, like you know, that should only be our worst problem, right? Uh, but, you know, it, it is somewhere down there on the list of worries and I think it's good that people are starting to think about it seriously, that there are at least a few people in the world who are, you know, trying to uh, think about how do you build a safe AI. Now, um, problem, you know, so there's sort of two aspects to it, right? One of them is when you think about a truly superhuman AI, right? Uh, the kind that like is, is basically a genie, right? And, uh, you know, like even if it's just a question answering system, it might sweet talk you into letting it out of its box. And then, you know, once it gets on the internet, it could somehow, you know, nefariously, you know, take over a weapons facility or, you know, somehow uh, commandeer the resources of the whole planet in some, you know, means that we can barely imagine. You know, and there are people thinking about that, and it's, and it's good to have pe a few people thinking about that. You know, the trouble uh, for me personally, right, it, it would be very, very uh, uh, hard for me to, uh, to get into this field because I would think, uh, um, uh, how do I know if I'm making progress or not? Right. Like uh, whatever I'm proposing, well, maybe it's just hastening the arrival of a dangerous AI by giving everyone a false sense of security. Right. Or, you know, like like we, we don't, you know, for obvious reasons, we don't have a chance to test things out with this kind of problem. Right. We have a chance to like, OK, let's just uh, uh, try to, you know, turn on this super intelligent AI and just, you know, let's check if it takes over the world or not. Right. You don't. you have only one, you know, as a. Uh, the um, uh, um, AI risk people like Eliezer Yudkowsky, as they themselves emphasize, you've got only one chance to get it right. And I think that, you know, we as a species, like, have no idea how to get right things that you have only one chance to get right. We've just, you know, we've effectively, we've never done it before, uh, as far as I know. Uh, you know, at, at least not in circumstances where you couldn't, you know, first test each of the individual components, you know, as you could with the uh, Apollo program or, or you know, or, or, or things of that kind. So, um, so then, you know, there's a whole nother um, uh, 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 branch of AI safety, which is where you think about things like self-driving cars, right? And how do you program them so that they have some kind of notion of human ethics, so that, you know, they may actually swerve in a way that, you know, kills the passenger in order to save three pedestrians or, or something like that, right? And, you know, and, and these um, uh, um, self-driving cars will have to be programmed with some type of ethics. And, you know, what's new about it is that it won't be ethics that, you know, the AI can just think of on the fly. It will all have to be explicitly thought about beforehand and pre-programmed in. And so all of these, like, debates of the moral philosophy seminar are going to become real in a way that, you know, the trolley problems and so on, you know, are, well, I'd say are becoming real already in a way that they weren't before. You know, likewise uh, with uh, the, you know, uh, deep network that uh, denies your loan application, right? Well, was it uh, doing it in a way that was discriminatory? Can it prove that it wasn't? Can it explain its decision? Can it justify to you why it did that? Uh, I think, you know, these are all, you know, these are all already very relevant questions and are only going to become more so. But, you know, unlike with the existential risk, at least these are scenarios where we can try things out. We can see what the consequences are, and we can learn from our mistakes, and we can iterate. And so, you know, my hope is that, you know, through these kinds of problems, you know, we will get better at building AIs that reflect our values, that will learn more about how to do it, and that some of that will ultimately be useful when AI, when and if AI finally reaches the point where it could just take over everything from us. Mm, interesting. Often people put it as philosophy of a deadline. Yeah. We're often struggling to understand what our values are ourselves. Yes. Um, if, we, if we had a lot of time, if we were ideal versions of ourselves, what mm -hmm. would we value? Yeah. Yeah, I had the problem of trying to figure that out. Yeah. Do we figure that out before the AI does? Or? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 
Have you followed much of um, DeepMind and especially more recently the Deep Fold stuff? Uh, so, um, I mean, I mean, I follow it with admiration as a, another outsider, I guess. I, uh, uh, you know, I work in a computer science department. I mean, these things have been revolutionary for all of computer science. Uh, so, um, I was making a joke recently, right? Like, I, in, in, th in theory, you know, we think about complexity classes like P and NP and whether they're equal or not. You know, is P equal to NP? Uh, but I think, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the machine learning people have uh, come increasingly to believe in an equation that uh, CS, computer science, equals AI equals ML, machine learning, equals DL, deep learning. <laughs> they believe in that collapse of complexity classes. Uh, and, uh, you know, so, so, you know, it's possible today to take a point of view where, you know, computer science is almost just is, is machine learning and everything else is like, uh, you know, all the rest of us are just sort of afterthoughts. Uh, but, um, uh, uh, so, 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 I mean, you know, these, these, these things, you know, have been transformative, uh, you know, to the, uh, you know, the point where, where, like, you know, there are all kinds of problems in computer science, like, uh, uh, problems in vision and in machine translation that used to be solved using very, very special purpose methods and using a lot of specialized domain knowledge, you know, either about scene recognition, about, uh, uh, um, about linguistics or whatever, and now they're just solved with this ge these very very general purpose hammers. Uh, uh, so that so that has been revolutionary, but uh, um, you know at the same time, uh, uh, I think you know all of the other aspects of computer science you know are still very relevant, and sometimes have even become more relevant. Like you know the uh, so so these deep networks, uh, you know, like the things that DeepMind is is doing, right, have the property that they need an enormous amount of hardware to run on uh, and they need an enormous amount of training data okay uh, uh, you know if they're trying to learn about uh, something in the real world as opposed to an abstract domain like chess or go uh, and so then there becomes the question you know how do you get all of that hardware how do you get it working well together how do you um, you know how do you get all of this data you know and these are very much kind of traditional computer science type of questions you know and then there's also uh, you know with deep learning uh, you know you, you well you tend to hear a lot more about the successes than the failures so one of the things that I've learned from my friends who work in deep learning, right, is that, you know, for every, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, for every uh, high impact success that you hear about, uh, you know, there were 50 things they tried that didn't work. And so I think, you know, there is, you know, and, 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 and furthermore, often when they do build things that work, you know, there is domain knowledge that gets encoded into it uh, uh, at the end of the day. So, you know, I mean, there's, or at the very least, there's a lot of uh, uh, experience of the practitioners about, you know, how do you tweak the parameters to get the thing to work. So, um, so I think that, uh, um, you know, I am, I'm very much like pro deep learning in the sense that I'm just, you know, I'm pro uh, anything that works, right? Uh, you know, and the, uh, like, as soon as I heard like some people in AI, like make, you know, like the sort of old guard in AI making arguments, oh, well, you know, this, you know, uh, these machine learning things, like they, you know, they merely work, but they don't, they don't really count because, you know, they don't really understand anything. So, you know, it was obvious to me that this is a losing argument, right? That this is, you know, the thing that works is going to take over eventually. Uh, uh, but, you know, uh, I think there's, 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 you know, until we get to the point where it really consistently does work and it does what we as humans want it to do, there's lots and lots more that needs to be done, you know, including in basic research. Uh, you know, and one, one of the most fundamental things that we're lacking is a theory about why deep learning works as well as it does, right? So, you know, to date, this field has been almost entirely empirical, right? It has been, you know, you know, you design the thing, you try it out, and you, you know, you just see see if it works. Uh, and uh, you know, it, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, the the theory, you know, the explanations of of uh, wh uh, why it works have lagged in, you know, enormously behind the practice and. Uh, uh, 
So um, why is it important to close that gap? Well, first of all, because if we did, we could maybe make it work better. But secondly, uh, to come back to your earlier question, because we could maybe make it work more safely. Okay, we could maybe, you know, make it uh, so that, uh, uh, you know, not only does your self-driving car work well in normal situations, but, you know, it is uh, uh, robust against a hacker who's going to, you know, flash something in front of it in order to try to make it crash. Uh, so, so I think that there is, uh, uh, yeah, so I'm very excited about what DeepMind and what the other, uh, you know, pioneers of deep learning have accomplished. And I think that um, um, all parts of computer science have uh, a lot, you know, to have a long ways to go uh, to make all of this, uh, do uh, all the things we want and make it work reliably and work safely. Uh, so, so f by FOOM, do you mean uh, the possibility of like a single AI in someone's basement, like if someone flips a switch and it goes from doing nothing very interesting to suddenly taking over the world? That's probably not too practical. Uh, that, that would probably be the extreme ideal, uh -huh. you know, just suddenly switching something on. But, you know, once getting to a certain point mm -hmm. of complexity and, and, and uh, interestingness, mm -hmm. it can then, you know, stop asymptoting and then sort of go up and, you know, begin to be able to, once it gets to the, the stage mm -hmm. of being able to self-recognize and, and self-improve mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in meaningful ways, do you think that it could sort mm -hmm. of shoot off? Uh, well, I mean, again, I don't know of any principle to say that it's impossible. Uh, you know, I think that, um, um, uh, you know, we, we, we don't have anything in our past experience uh, that, that's analogous to it, right? So we're sort of, uh, uh, you know, asking about, uh, you know, a, a, a logical possibility that's, that's sort of unlike anything that's ever been seen, right? And so, you know, I, I, uh, the closest analogy I could think of is sometimes people ask things like, well, what if, you know, these, these famous math problems like uh, the Riemann hypothesis or P versus NP, what if they're independent of the axioms of set theory? And you could neither prove nor disprove them, right? And it's like, you know, well, no one can rule that out. It's a logical possibility. And yet, you know, until we have even one uh, genuine example of it, you know, it's hard to uh, it's hard to evaluate as likelihood. Or you know, we can't really do statistics with a sample of size zero. Uh, so. Um, you know, and, and um, you know, of course, like, like with, with any new technology, right, you could raise the worry, well, because this has never been tried before, maybe it will destroy the world, right? I mean, people did raise that worry about, uh, uh, you know, the first nuclear weapon, which, you know, indeed, maybe they should have, right? There was a worry that, would it, that it would ignite the atmosphere. And then the uh, Manhattan Project physicists actually did a calculation to show that it wouldn't. Okay, uh, but you know there was this uh, worry with the Large Hadron Collider, right? Before it was switched on, people thought maybe it are, it's going to create miniature black holes that will just swallow up the uh, the Earth. Uh, now you know there's a lot that can be said, uh, even just in physics, against that possibility, right? If there, if miniature black holes were created and the laws of physics are anything like we think they have to be, then they would just almost immediately evaporate. Okay. But, um, you know, okay, if you're probing nature at an energy scale that's above what any other particle collider has done before, yeah, you could worry maybe it's going to destroy the Earth, right? You know, or you can just look for uh, the closest analogs you know, right? So in that case, um, I guess the closest analog was cosmic rays. Right. So, you know, the Earth has actually been bombarded since its creation by cosmic rays that have much higher energies than the LHC. And yet they haven't destroyed the world. And, you know, that was one of the strongest arguments, uh, or most most conclusive arguments, let's say, in favor of the LHC being safe, as indeed it uh, turned out to be. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be here doing this interview. Uh, but uh, uh, with, with, with AI, we have to, you know, I guess in a trying to evaluate something like this FOOM scenario, we have to ask, well, what is the closest analog? You know, maybe it's... Uh, um, the evolution from, uh, um, you know, our, our uh, ape ancestors into humans, right? Well, that, that took a few million years. Uh, now, we know that things can happen many orders of magnitude faster with computers, right? But, you know, it wasn't, um, 
uh, you know, on the on the one hand, like it, you know, you could say it took a long time, right? You know, also the invention of agriculture maybe took some thousands of years, right? So you could say, uh, like, on a human time scale, these things took a long time. On the other hand, like on a geological time scale, or on the time scale of all of nature, these things were all, were really were almost instantaneous, right? Like if you were looking at uh, uh, snapshots of the Earth, like once every million years, right? You might see like a certain level of change that just remains pretty constant, you know, punctuated every once in a while by something like the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs, right? And then just in the last million years, you know, slowly these uh, uh, these hominids start doing more and more things, and then, you know, uh, after the last ice age ended, right, then things just take off at this ridiculous rate. Uh, so, you know, so the fear, of course, is that, uh, you know, AI will eventually uh, get to that kind of point. Uh, so, as I said, you know, I don't know anything in the basic principles of physics or computer science to rule that out. Uh, all I can say is that it is it's not per on my personal list of things that I worry about the most in the near term. I just, you know, you know, because something would have to happen, you know, unlike anything we know about, whereas like, for example, for climate change to destroy the world, all that has to happen is for well understood 19th century physics and chemistry to continue playing themselves out the way that they have been.